How many chokes would a ham radio choke if a ham radio could choke chokes? Is it okay to charge your LifePo 4 battery through a charge controller without using a solar panel? And are you allowed to put wires in trees for your POTA activation this time on Mailbag Monday? What is happening? Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio Tube. My name is Mike K at MRD. If you have an amateur radio related question for me, shoot me an email, K at MRD at iCloud.com. We've got four great questions today from three great people. So let's dive right in. This first question has, well, two questions. Uh, first, he says, thanks for blessing us with your knowledge. I always learn something from your videos. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Two follow-up questions from yesterday's Mailbag Money, which would be last week now. What is that yellow wire you're using for your NFED half wave? It looks super lightweight. Well, it is this right here. This is 26 gauge soda beams wire. It's absolutely delicious. I love it. It's stupid cheap. If we hop over to their website, which is sodabeams.co.uk, head over to Antenna Accessories and Hardware. We're looking for this antenna wire lightweight right here. And then we're going to click on the yellow, or you can get it in uh, black, or is that black? I don't know, whatever color that is, or uh, green. Oh, yellow, military green, or brown. There you go. I like the yellow high-vis stuff. Stupid cheap, twelve fifty-four dollars for 100 meters. Uh, I think the shipping last time I bought it was about 17 bucks. really like 30 bucks for 100 meters of this wire. It's absolutely fantastic. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, and I've only ever had it fail once on me. So that's been my main go-to NFET half-wave wire for a couple of years now. Uh, technically, the uh, poly stealth wire, which I really like a lot as well, same gauge, um, is is a stronger wire. Uh, but I just it doesn't the poly stealth doesn't come in this high vis yellow, so that's really the main reason I use this soda beams wire. It's just really highly visible. And his second question was, what is the right number of ferrites if I build one of those chokes from ABR? Is it like tacos? More is more better. Well, <laughs> I can certainly appreciate uh, the taco analogy there. So uh, to a degree, yes, more is better. So uh, on ABR's website, you can you can pick what coax you want. Heck, we can do it right now. You just go to abrn.com under product information, amateur radio coax builder. Select which coax you want. Let's just use ABR 240 Ultra Flex, similar to uh, RG8. Pick your length there. Let's say we want 50 feet. Pick a connector. Let's say I want UHF male and UHF male. Then down here under ferrites, we can select none, three, five, or seven. So when I was visiting ABR uh, the last time, I was talking with Chuck about exactly this, and I have a, a, a quite a few of their uh, inline chokes. And basically what Chuck was telling me is three is good, five's better, seven is the best. And really after seven, you kind of get this diminishing return where it, it kind of just doesn't matter. So I've got a couple uh, of their chokes here. Both of these have seven ferrites in there. So if you were to order one of these, you just order like two feet of coax and then pick. So here's like an, uh, an SO239 to a, I've got an adapter, but there's a PL259 on here. Same thing, SO239, PL259. Now here's one for RG316 that I've got a BNC female and a BNC male on. Um, both of these have seven. This one has five. You can also order, so like here's a 50 foot run of RG316. This one has one, two, three, four, five chokes on it. So it really just depends on, so like with this RG316, you can see five is kind of, you know, if I had two more on here, it'd be even longer. So it'd be a bit uh, more difficult for me to put in my pack. And uh, that's kind of why I went with the five there. But you can also, if you have just the little ferrite beads like this here, you can wind your coax in there a bunch of times. So I've wound the, wound the coax in there three times with the with the center going in. So there's really four turns of, of choking, choke, chokiness here. That's the technical term, choking, chokiness. Um, so how's that for an answer? <laughs> and don't forget, I'll put a link in the description. But uh, if you go to ABR, if you want to pick up anything from them, use code K at MRD. ABR gives 10% off on all their products. You can give them a call, mention you, you, you saw this video, drop my call sign, and uh, you'll get 10% off of some am amazing USA made coaxial cable. So thanks for writing in. 
Next, we've got a question about charging through solar charge controllers from our good friend Shane over at Scout75 YouTube channel. Go check him out. He's asking, is it safe to supply non-solar power to a solar charge controller? I'm just curious if it would be safe to feed a solar charge controller with 12 volts from a wall mount uh, LifePo 4 charger or possibly DC from a vehicle. I like the idea of plugging the battery box into my truck on the way home from a long day at POTA so I can top off the battery on the drive home. However, I don't like the idea of sitting next to a burning LifePo 4 battery in my truck while traveling at highway speeds. That I wouldn't worry about. You, you got to try really darn hard, uh, and, and I've done a video showing uh, what happens. LifePo 4 is so safe, you're not going to be sitting next to a burning battery, so don't worry about that. I know I was able to charge the battery with mains power without going through the solar charge controller. Just want to confirm how careful I need to be. My gut tells me it should be safe, but yeah, I just need to remember the video when you and your buddy shot LifePo 4. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's a great question, Shane. Thanks for writing. Now, in the longer email he sent, he did mention he's using a Genesun MPPT charge controller for this. I happen to have a bunch of charge controllers, PWM and MPPT. So let's hop over on that bench right there and take a look. So here we have an array of solar charge controllers. These back three are PWM and these four are MPPT. I have a lead coming from my MFJ4230 uh, DMP power supply set to 13.8 volts. And I also have a six amp LifePo4 charger from BioNO to do this test. So let's try the pulse width modulation first and then we'll go to the MPPT. So let's first take a look at the Buddy Pole Power Mini 2. Great charge controller. It is PWM, but I've had very good luck with it. We'll start with the uh, BioNO charger, the six amp charger. We'll go ahead, I'm plugging it in to the yellow and black solar input, which that wire goes right here to the solar input. I'll go ahead and flip the switch. And we can see here we're getting 14.4-ish volts in. This battery is pretty much charged, but now we're getting amp and a half of current in it right now. Now, what happens if we just put 13.8 volts into it? What will happen? So now we're only seeing 13.6 volts, 0.17 amps. So it, it can't charge above what you're putting out. So it's not gonna fully top out the battery. So uh, it is working, but who knows how much. Next, we'll take a look at this Bouge RV in my little go box here. We'll plug in the BioNO charger first. Go ahead and turn that on. And we can see we're starting to ramp up in voltage there. And we're ramping up in current, 5.9 amps, just like that. No problem at all. But what happens if we plug in the 13.8 volts? As that cycles through again, see we're only getting 0.8 amps because it's kind of already at that voltage to begin with. So it's not gonna, again, charge your battery fully. Now here's a BioNO 20 amp charge controller. Again, we'll plug this into the charge controller socket. Go ahead and turn it on. Now we're starting to charge. We can see on our meter here, our current is ramping up 5.76. That's about what I get out of this uh, charger. So six amps roughly of current going in, no problem at all. And then again, we'll plug in the power supply and see what that does. So it is doing something here, but we're getting mm, 1.6 amps in. And this battery is pretty much empty. This is a brand new battery shipped right from BioNO, so not taking a lot with that 13.8 volts. Will it do it? Yeah, effectively, not really with, uh, without a charger. But now what happens if you just plug your 13.8 volts directly to the battery? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Let's find out. Will it work? I don't know. So this is just wired directly to the battery. We'll go ahead and flip the switch and we'll see. Ah, we're still only getting uh, almost two amps, not much, not as, not as much as an actual charger will put out. So let's plug in the BioNO charger and watch what happens right here. Bam, 5.77 amps, no problem at all. Now let's take a look at some MPPT chargers. This is the one that I picked up at the Huntsville Ham Fest from HamSource, great charge controller, no RFI. And we'll go ahead and plug in the 13.8 volts into this is my solar input here and we will see what happens. Nothing happening on this meter, 
nothing happening on my meter here. So no power is going through this charge controller at all. Now let's plug in the lithium iron phosphate charger. See if that works. No current coming in here. No current coming in here. So strike one for MPPT. This is a 20 amp MPPT charger that I got from Battery of Power. Again, we'll plug in the 13.8 volts first. See if anything happens there. Nothing happening on the meter. Nothing happening on the charge controller. Let's try the charger. Nothing happening there. Nothing happening there, no current. This is the 10 amp MPPT charge controller from Batteria that looks uh, exactly like the one I got from HamSource. And let's try 13.8 volts. Nothing there, nothing there, so nothing's going through. And let's try the charger. Nothing and nothing. And this itty bitty little guy is the original charge controller that I had in here. It is MPPT, it works great, but it's all kinds of noisy for RFI. So again, we'll try our 13.8 volts and we're not getting anything on the meter there. And then we'll go ahead and try our charger and nothing again. And the light is green on here. Now that was enough to turn the light on. I don't know if you can see it here. There's a little light underneath this heat shrink that is on now with a higher voltage with the 14 volts, but uh, still not enough to put power through uh, these chargers. Well, so that was an interesting test. It looked like now with my sample size of seven charge controllers from six different manufacturers and two different types, it looked like the pulse width modulation charge controllers will allow you to charge through them with a lower voltage than what a solar panel would put out. The MPPTs, not so much. Now I can't speak for every MPPT charge controller or any char every charge controller uh, out there for that matter, but we did see a trend there. So with that MPPT, uh, it's probably not gonna work. Are you gonna hurt anything? No, no currents passing through it. It's just not gonna open up the floodgates. Maybe there's a, a diode or something in there that uh, won't trigger until it sees that higher voltage, but uh, try it, let me know. I, I'd be curious uh, with that Genesun what happens, but I suspect we'd see similar results as my other MPPTs. Now, for charging mobile, Probably the better option, because as we saw that 13.8 volts going into any of the batteries really didn't do much. This is a mobile lithium iron phosphate charger for doing exactly what you want to do. It's got a little cigarette lighter plug here. It's got a power pole and a, uh, uh, a coaxial on there. Both either one of those can plug into the batteries. Now I'm kind of on the fence of how I feel about this charger. Yes, it works great. I've used it, but it's only three amps. So if you're driving an hour, you've only put three amp uh, hours back into your battery, which probably isn't going to top it off unless you're doing QRP. So uh, it's a nice thing to have if you're roving. You can definitely put some power back into the battery between parks, kind of top it off that way maybe. But if you're if you're out all day, this is not going to do much to charge your battery. So uh, and it's uh, it's over a hundred bucks. I know that. So, but it is something to look at. So, hey, thank uh, Shane. Thanks for writing in. Good luck with the battery box. I uh, I know uh, you will have a lot of fun with that project. Lastly, we have a question about my passion, my two passions, Parks on the Air and Antennas. This viewer is writing, Mike, thank you for your videos. I'm a new general. Congratulations. By a few months and plan to hunt and activate POTA. I'm currently budgeting for my HF radio and antenna. My family takes a few mini vacations a year out of state and I would love to activate those parks. I've heard that some parks may have restrictions on using wire antennas put up in a tree. Would any information like this be listed on the park's website? Is there any info like this on the POTA website? If not, I think it would be beneficial. I agree. I want to follow all the rules to have fun activations. Thanks again. And POTA on 73 from Buster KN4 JQP. So that's a great question. And, and really the answer is it depends uh, on the parks on the air website. To my knowledge, there is no such information uh, pertaining to what you are asking, but you can always go to either the state just the general state parks uh, website in the state that you're in or the state that you're going in and uh, look for like their rules and regulations. So for example, let's hop over to the Texas uh, parks and see what they say. So here we are into the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's park rules. This is all I could find. Uh, and I'm sure other states 
hopefully we'll have something like this. But here we talk about alcohol, arms and firearms. Yeah, we can carry in Texas. That's right, baby. Campfires, collecting, drones, firewood, geocaching, hammocks, litter, parking pets, quiet hours, blah, 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 snakes. I love snakes. Tent camping. That's about it. There's there's nothing at all about putting wire in trees or doing anything. The closest is hammocks, in fact, where it tells you what you can and can't do to a tree, uh, but nothing to the to the effect of throwing a rope over a tree to hang anything. Uh, so that's about all I could tell you. I do know in Texas, I've never had a single problem at any of the parks that I've gone to with, uh, I don't usually throw things over a tree limb. I'm usually like leaning a mast into a tree, but I, I do. I mean, I, I throw ropes over and put wire antennas up, just not as often. I put stakes in the ground. Um, I'm usually in the day use area though. So, but even in the camping areas, you put tent stakes down. So I, I would really say it's gonna vary state by state. I know when I lived in Michigan, I was told, uh, I never actually researched it, but I was told that they don't want you putting, uh, like throwing ropes over trees. And the reason being is um, to protect nature, to protect the sanctity of that park. If you're throwing ropes over trees, you could inadvertently break a tree branch, which would, I know it sounds kind of minuscule, but that is human interaction affecting the wildlife negatively. And, and they want to, you know, we want to protect these few tiny little bastions of land that that man hasn't completely destroyed yet. So uh, I get the reasoning, but yeah, you, you're just going to have to check and uh, use your best judgment. I'm an ask forgiveness instead of permission guy, so uh, don't take that as <laughs> legal advice. But uh, I would kind of, you know, see if there's any kind of frequently asked questions like that there. If you can't find anything, just go out and start activating. If you get hassled, you get hassled and then, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> them's what I got so hey thanks so much for watching guys if you have a question for me shoot me an email at k at mrd at icloud.com we'll see you next time on ham radio tube 73